Hosanna! Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the coming kingdom of our ancestor David. Hosanna in the highest heaven. My dear friends in Christ, since the beginning of Lent until now, we have prepared our hearts by penance and charitable works. On this day we gather to herald with the whole church the beginning of the celebration of our Lord's Paschal Mystery, that is to say, of his Passion and his Resurrection. For it was to accomplish this great mystery that Jesus entered his own city, the holy city of Jerusalem. Therefore, with faith and devotion, let us now commemorate that day, the Lord's entry into the city of Jerusalem for our salvation. Following in his footsteps, that being made by his good grace partakers of his holy cross, we may also have a share in his resurrection and new life. A reading from the Holy Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ according to Saint John. The next day, a great crowd had come to the festival, and they had heard that Jesus was coming into Jerusalem. So they took branches of palm trees and went out to meet him, shouting, Hosanna! Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord, the King of Israel. Jesus found a young donkey and sat on it, as it is written, Do not be afraid, daughter of Zion. Look, your king is coming, sitting on a donkey's colt. Jesus' disciples did not understand these things at first, but when Jesus was glorified, then they remembered all the things that had been written of him and had been done to him. The Gospel of Christ. Praise to you, Lord Jesus Christ. My dear friends, today we celebrate Palm Sunday, also known as Passion Sunday. Today marks the beginning of Holy Week. Now, I have to admit that preaching on Palm Sunday is like trying to capture Niagara Falls in a Dixie cup. There's way too much stuff going on, so we have to focus and practice reserve. And I'm going to practice reserve today by focusing on one theme, the central theme, the passion. Suffering is an inconvenient fact of life. I've always been told that you can't sell a negative. And in our world today, let's be honest, suffering is one of those unsellable negatives. Our world doesn't like suffering and uncertainty. But at the same time, suffering and uncertainty is at the heart of our Christian story of redemption. I mean, really, you can't look at the cross without realizing that suffering is a part of the central message. And the fact that we as a community, when we can gather, gather around an altar, well, that just emphasizes the point even more. In one sense, marketing gurus tell us that you can't sell a negative. And yet for 
over 2,000 years, the church has and continues essentially to sell a negative. So why does the Christian story of suffering endure? Well, I believe it endures because Christianity offers the world the hope and also the promise of redemptive suffering. See, we don't sell the idea of meaningless suffering. Christianity is not about pointless suffering. We as followers of Jesus Christ believe and hope in the power of redemptive suffering. And redemptive suffering is best defined by the word passion, or in Greek, pathos. Pathos, passion, means to awaken, to arouse, to evoke deep emotion. Pathos is a form of truth, but it's truth that is felt. It's felt truth. It's born within one's body and in one's soul. Pathos is something that we feel deep down inside of us, in the, in the marrow of our bones, in the pulp of our teeth. It throbs in the back of the head. It, it pulsates in a rush of blood to the ears. It claims us. It can overwhelm us, and it can also bear us away. Think of something as simple as a beautiful sunset or a gorgeous piece of music, perhaps the birth of a child. All of these things can help us and can cause us to feel very deep down inside. Let me tell you a story of pathos, of passion. On September the 25th, 2006, my father had a heart attack. He died cutting the grass. Dad was 59 years old. He worked his whole life, and he only had three weeks before retiring. His death wasn't supposed to happen. Things weren't supposed to happen like that. After his funeral, I was in my old bedroom back at home, It was a very, very hot day, and I was taking off my suit and my tie. My shirt was drenched with sweat, and Martha sat on the bed beside me, and she said, I've got something to tell you. Maybe you should sit down. I looked at her, and I laughed kind of jeeringly and said, Martha, after this week, I can take whatever you have to say standing. And then she looked me in the eye and she said, I'm pregnant. Well, I couldn't believe it. And in that moment, I was overwhelmed, right? You can understand. I've just returned from the cemetery. My shirt is still wet from the sweat. And now the news, a child is on the way. I was overwhelmed by a very intense feeling, a mixture of profound sadness at Dad's passing, but also ecstatic joy about the future. And that's what we mean, theologically speaking, when we talk about passion, about pathos and redemptive suffering. You see, pathos is something that we feel. We feel it deep down. Like I said, it's something that we seem to feel in the marrow of our bones, in the pulp of our teeth. It throbs in the back of the head. It pulsates in a sudden rush of blood to the ears. 
And even in my own case, in the midst of one of the saddest moments of my life, God did a new thing. And that meaningless and pointless suffering of Dad's early death, it was transformed. It was redeemed. In Jesus, God is doing a new thing. Today we remember the triumphal entry into the holy city of Jerusalem, and we are thrust into Good Friday and Holy Week. We begin a journey today toward the outpouring of the Holy Spirit at Pentecost, and all of these things have absolutely no precedence in history until they are fulfilled in Jesus Christ. God is doing in Jesus a new thing. So now we have to remember, we have to stretch our imaginations that when Jesus enters into Jerusalem, into the holy city over 2,000 years ago, God is about to do a brand new thing. The people can feel it, but they can't name it. They can feel it, but they don't understand it. They feel it very, very deep down inside of them, and we know this because it's an emotion that cannot be contained. It's an emotion that cannot be explained away. And all the people could do with this emotion was to cry out, Hosanna, Hosanna to the son of David. Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. God is about to do a new thing. 2,000 years ago, when Jesus enters into the holy city of Jerusalem, his mother, his family, his friends, his disciples, his followers, they had no idea. They had no idea what God was up to at that point in time. All they had was pathos. They had a deep feeling in the marrow of their bones that God was fulfilling a promise, that God was doing a new thing. Now, folks, that's faith. That's faith. To meet one's death, to face great uncertainty with nothing but a, a deep feeling in the, in the marrow of one's bones, in the throbbing in one's teeth, in the rush of blood to the ears, that's faith. And if you've ever experienced that, if you've ever experienced that feeling, even as something simple as a sunset, a gorgeous piece of music, or in the birth of a child, if you have experienced that deep down feeling inside of you, then you know what we mean when we talk about pathos and passion and redemptive suffering. The bearing in one's own body and in one's own soul a truth that cannot be fully understood, but it can only be experienced and shouted out like the people did 2,000 years ago when they knew but they couldn't explain what God was up to. Hosanna, Hosanna to the Son of David. Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. My dear friends, I will be praying with you and for you. May you observe a very holy week. And now, if you would, in the silence of your own hearts and homes, 
as we prepare to pray the prayer that Jesus himself taught us, to pray for all those who are facing any trials or tribulations in their own lives. We pray for our world. We pray for those who continue to be adversely affected by COVID-19 and the global pandemic. We remember our world experiencing its own pathos. And now gathering our prayers and praises into one, let us pray as our Savior Christ hath taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. My friends, I invite you now to bow your heads and pray for God's blessing. May the Spirit, who strengthens us to suffer with Christ, that we might share in his eternal glory, set your minds on life and on the peace Jesus offers. And may the blessing of God the Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be amongst you and remain with you always. I hope that you've enjoyed today's service as much as I enjoyed putting it together. It's a real delight, actually, to be at St. Albans photographing some of those beautiful stained glass windows that help tell the story. You know, a picture says a, a thousand words, and so it's very important for me in these days as I'm beginning, and also knowing how long it's been since you've been in your own parish church, to try to bring some of the beauty, some of the familiarity of the building uh, to you in your own home. So I hope that it's, it's helpful to take both the message and some of those beautiful artistic features and bring them together. What I really wanted to say today was uh, to offer you some encouragement as we are going into Holy Week, that there will be continual opportunities for you to join your community online during these upcoming and holy days. For example, on Maundy Thursday, I will be joining Martha Tatarnik, my wife at St. George's Anglican Church, for a service of Holy Communion on Maundy Thursday. And invitation is extended for you to also tune in and join us from the sanctuary at St. George's on Maundy Thursday in the evening. On Good Friday, I will, again, download and upload a video from the sanctuary at St. Albans for a short service of the word on Good Friday. On Holy Saturday, if you wish to join us in the evening, once again, I will be at St. George's and St. Catherine's uh, celebrating the Easter Vigil and Holy Communion at St. George's. Again, feel free to drop in online if that's helpful for you. And the big one, of course, we're all looking forward to is the Easter Sunday celebration, which will uh, air on Easter Sunday morning at about 6 a.m. For anybody who wishes to uh, join us at St. Albans for the Easter service. So I hope that all of those times, which are going to be included in an email with all of the links, are helpful for you. And I look forward to uh, leading you in worship in this time. And of course, we continue to hope and we continue to pray for a good resolution to the world pandemic and a time when we can all join one another at St. Albans. For me, 
for the first time with you, and for you, I'm sure, a good time and a long time in coming. So have a holy week, and I will be seeing you online. Thanks, folks. Take care.